Uh, the next pres presentation by Fan Gang, who will talk about achievements, challenges, and opportunities in cochlear transplant, uh, transplants and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank, thank, uh, thanks uh, to Gerd for your invitation to speak here. <laughs> and, uh, after coming back uh, from a, a week-long trip in Asia, so I'm a little bit jet-lagged. <laughs> But anyway, what I would like to talk to you about today you know, is about the achievement of cochlear implants, but more importantly, the challenges and opportunities and some solutions you know, that are not only specific to cochlear implants, you know, but to biomedical engineering in general. Um, For anybody who work in a biomedical engineering problem, you know you have to identify the needs, and hearing loss, right? It, you know, is is a is a is a very important need, and if you look at the both end of the lifespan, you know, it's a number one birth defect, right? In children, you know, every thousand babies, you got a couple of them who have hearing loss, and if you look at the other end of the spectrum, right? I mean, we're talking about the. Uh, 400 million, it's almost the U.S. population, right, it suffer from hearing loss, a loss globally. But I think the most important thing, and you know, if you look at uh, what Helen Keller uh, saying about hearing loss, I mean, you know Helen Keller, who is both blind and deaf, right? And Helen said, you know, blindness isolated me from objects, but deafness isolated me from people. Right. It's a very important question for us uh, to solve, you know, to improve the quality, the quality of life for hearing impaired people. Well, cochlear implants are the only medical treatment to solve deafness. Right? Someday we'll get it to transplantation, but not there yet. Right? And if you look at uh, what cochlear implants have done right? I mean, in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, Right. I mean, there's a, about 750,000 people who have benefited from cochlear implants. Half of them are adults, the other half are children. And more importantly, for children who receive the cochlear implant, right, they will allow them to not only listen to sound, but also develop language. And that's very important, so they can go to men's school without special education. And as a matter of fact, many of the deaf schools uh, are closing down as a result of the cochlear implants, right? And more importantly, cochlear implants removed the stigma associated with the deafness. It's a pretty cool picture here, right? In a cochlear implant kid says, why do I have to get a cochlear implant? Right? Well, you cannot hear. And the dad <laughs> tried to convince the little girl, well, cochlear implant's cool. Shaved his head and have a tattoo. Right. And as I, I'm going to tell you at the end of my talk, you know, maybe in 10, 20 years, every one of us will have something like that, even a normal hearing person. Um, you know, where was, there's an old saying, you know, we're all standing on the shoulder of giants, right? One of the giants in uh, cochlear implants is a doctor, Bill House, and who was a medical doctor developed the first commercialized cochlear implants, got FDA approval in 1984 against the resistance and I would say straight objection uh, from the mainstream scientific, engineering, medical, and even deaf communities. Right? And I was able to talk to him uh, two weeks before his death. So I got a lot of inside information and I wrote a review and, uh, and an article about him. And you guys can read it if you're interested. But thanks to pioneers like Bill House, right, you know, who developed a very simple device. You know, it's just a receiver, two coils, and the end of the two wires sticking out, one's serving as a ground, the other as a, a stimulating electrode. And he used a speech to amplitude modulate a 16 kilohertz sinusoidal carrier. I mean, that's just like AM radio, nothing more than that. But you know, he was able to bring a deaf person uh, to the world of sound. And that turned out to be very important. 
right? And uh, you know, before that, a deaf person was not able to hear any sound. Now, you know, his simple device allows the deaf person to hear. But what you're going, what you're going to see on the y-axis, well, there's not much open set speech understanding. What it means is, what well, the patient who have received his simple one channel cochlear implant really didn't understand speech. We're talking about single digits, right? And then thanks to a person from Australia, you know, Graham Clark, he said, well, one electrode was not enough. Why don't we give them 22? So he improved the hardware design you know, such that he was able to bring uh, speech recognition, you know, from maybe a few percentage points to about a 20%. But that was still not enough, right? And uh, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, you know, I was part of this kind of software development, a pretty exciting time. Right? And we improved speech perception from 10, 20% to 80%. And that 80% will allow a deaf person to carry a conversation on the telephone or deaf child to develop a normal language. Right? And if we look at this, you know, and I would say, you know, the critical contribution is from zero to one, you know, thanks to Bill House, right? And the hardware development, you know, I call it, it's more like incremental, you know, brand speech recognition from one to 10. And of course, the software improvement in you know, a broad speech recognition from 10 to 80 or 90, 100%, right? And this is important because we've been trying to nominate you know, cochlear implant inventors for Nobel Prize. And so who contributed to what? You know, that's a, oh, we'll see you know, what's going to happen. Uh, I'd like to play you my acoustic simulation of cochlear implants. So, this is an example of an eight channel processor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, you know, you heard this implant simulation. It's not perfect, but it will allow you to, you know, understand speech, at least in quiet, all right? Now, that, was, that happened in 1995. You know, what happened uh, in the last 25 years? Well, what was interesting to see is uh, on the left y-axis, uh, you know, there's a number of publications in cochlear implant field, and you can see there's exponential growth Right, from 1995 you know, to now. And if you do the math, you know, every paper, it's about 1,000 papers a year now. You know, every paper is $100,000. So we're at least investing $100 million in the field. But what's interesting, if you look at the performance on the, y, on the, the right y-axis, the speech recognition performance has not improved at all, remained about the same. So there's a discrepancy between discrepancy between the two. Whatever you put in, you don't get it, the necessary output. And you know, this is a, a problem, right? Well, I'm trying to figure out, you know, as a person who has been working in this field for so long, you know, what, what are the issues here? Well, this is the challenges I'm trying to uh, identify. And uh, I will say there are three words, started with the P. The first one, pitch which is the most significant limiting factor right, for cochlear implant performance. To illustrate this point, you know, I'm going to just simply play the same simulation. Instead of a speech sounds, melody, piece of music, see if you guys can recognize you know, what the melody was played. Can anybody guess what, what kind of a music instrument, what melody did I play? Well, it's, it's pretty hard because uh, the normal person, I mean a cochlear implant person, get basically chance performance. So I'll play uh, the, the original music so you can see what the problem is. So if you look at the performance uh, you know, from the cochlear implant 
now to restoration of a normal hearing, you see how far we have to go. Well, what are the biomedical engineering problem here we're facing? Well, the biomedical engineering problem we're facing is the electrode to neural interface. This is not only for cochlear implants, for any neural prosthesis or neural modulation uh, uh, devices you're trying to develop, is that mismatch, the mismatch between electrodes, and here I'm showing the big electrode. Um, I mean, there are three screens, right? So that a kind of uh, a D shape is the, the electrode we put into the inner ear, and the dimension of that is about one millimeter, right, in diameter, okay? And where are the neurons? Well, the neurons, if I put the original one on top of that, uh, it's hard to see. Uh, amplify it, right? And the neurons, and if you think about it, this is tree leaves on the other side of the corner, and your electrodes, it's, it's a big giant standing here. And if you want to get one-to-one -one communication between your electrode and that neuron sitting up there, it's almost impossible. Right? That's the problem. And if you do the numbers, you know, we're talking about you know, at least a thousand-fold mismatch you know, between the electrode in terms of numbers or size or the number of neurons and receptors you, know, you have, right? I mean, this is a, the problem not only unique to cochlear implants, retinal implants, or if you want to do sleep apnea, well, how do you control the, the hypoglossal nerve uh, specifically in the same issue we're facing you know, in, 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 in the overall field? And of course, how do we solve that problem? You know, we've talked about the Utah penetrating electrode, and I saw Yu Chen here, you know, we dabbed into that, trying to develop some uh, thin film, high density electrodes. Well, pretty exciting, you know, NIH, European, Chinese, Japanese government put a lot of money in these projects. Um, but my question is, you want to commercialize this product? We're not talking about research. You can put 1,000 or 2,000 electrodes. How do you connect that electrodes to an outside world? Well, no, very few people talk about that, right? It's easy for us to do 20 electrodes, connect them to the outside. Well, how do you connect 1,000 or 2,000 electrodes? This is a significant bottleneck uh, for the field to solve. The second challenge, right, in cochlear implants, and also you know, medical device in general, is power, right? And you know, if you have a game console, you know, we're talking about 10 watts, cochlear implants these days, the best we can do, about 10 milliwatts. But how much power a natural inner ear consumes? Well, 10 microwatts. So what it means is uh, if it gives you like a AAA battery, it will last for three days for current cochlear implant, but will last for 10 years for the natural the inner ear. And uh, the power consumption, as I tell you, is going to be important because it comes at a price. Uh, you know, some people may not even afford the batteries, even if we give them a free cochlear implant. And I'll illustrate a little more. And the problem with the, or the potential solution, you know, to solve the power supply problem or consumption problem, well, you need some kind of hybrid device and uh, this is, a, I mean, think about how much advances the consumer electronics has developed in battery technology. Think about your cell phones. Think about, you know, your electric cars. Well, <laughs> the implants, ex with a few exceptions, and Exonics is one of them, you know, they have hybrid power supply. Put in chargeable, put a chargeable battery inside, Current cochlear implants, there's no battery inside. Right? Current the pacemakers, they only have battery. And then once it's dead, you have to do a mi microsurgery to replace it. Maybe hybrid system like that, you can charge it, recharge it as, you know, to solve it. But how do you optimize it in a medical device company? And we haven't taken full advantage of battery technology in consumer electronics, and we need to. The final challenge, you know, is the price, right? And, uh, you know, when I'm showing a picture, you know, on the y-axis is the number of units sold worldwide, 
and the, 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 the right y-axis is the price. So, you know, the volume has gone up. You know, so you have sold, we have been able to, to sell a lot of implants. The volume goes up, and you would expect right, the price comes down. Right? That's a natural business model. But we haven't seen that happen. Well, the only possibility is there's a monopoly in the field where you have that disassociation between volume and price. And there's one dominant player in the field called the Cochlear Corporation in Australia that controls about 70% of the world market that will allow them to control the price, rip the profit, right, while increasing their volume. And so it still, Cochlear implant, it still costs about forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 per device. And what that means is, you know, imagine if you go to Africa, right, and one cochlear implant is one Mercedes Benz. If you want to get a two cochlear implants, well, it's two Mercedes Benz. In Sudan, the annual income is $500. Family, $500. And you're selling, trying to sell them 50,000 cochlear implants. So what that means, well, if you don't eat, you work for 100 years, you will get one cochlear implant. But that's not what we want to, uh, to do as a biomedical engineer, right? Because you want to try to solve problem to benefit people not in high income, but low and middle income countries. And that's what, you know, what I've been doing the last 10 years. You know, we're trying to produce a low, co low cost cochlear implant, but you don't want to sacrifice performance. How do you do that? Well, there's only one choice, which is, you know, I call the Apple model. And the Apple model, basically, you know, did you get your Apple on the back? It says, uh, designed in California, assembled in China. This is exactly what we, I did, right? You know, we had the R&D center, and we transferred technology, you know, from U.S., but manufactured the cochlear implant uh, in China. And, uh, you know, got a device. We run clinical trial, and the performance is similar to the existing high cost cochlear implants. There's no difference. Got 80%. And uh, the impact of, uh, you know, when we introduced this low cost implant in 2011, in China, there's a government tender program. It's a bidding process. Before we got into the market, the cochlear implant in that tender program was $40,000, and you can see keep getting down as we join the bidding process. I'm telling you right now, the cochlear implants in China, only in China, it's 10 times less. It's about 4,000 US dollars. And what it means is, you know, for the same amount of money 10 years ago, you, you get one cochlear implant, now you can get a 10 cochlear implants. So 10 more times uh, children can benefit from that. And I think that's very significant. And the problem, not again, it's not just cochlear implant. You know, for any med medical device development or drug development in low-income countries, that's what I'm facing right now. Is how do you sustain that? Well, we have the initial technology introduced, but the field is moving on. Right? Who's going to contribute to R&D to maintain that low cost and performance level? Well, that's the problem. You know. And we have a business model we have to solve. And uh, the final two or three minutes, I'll, I'll, you know, this is something very generic. I, mean, I call that a grand opportunity, which is to solve the communication issue between outside world and inside world. We are called a main machine interface, right? Or brain computer interface, whatever you call that, right? I mean, we said the last two, or last centimeter problem, you know, how do you get outside stuff inside your own body? Well, Google tried, Google Glass, or Google Lens, but failed. Because the eyes, you know, they're soft tissue, it's hard to put hardware inside. But on the other hand, the ear, it's a natural, integrated main machine interface. About two or three years ago, you know, Google sponsored a workshop, locked 20 or so people inside a dark room for two or three days. <laughs> you know, we came up with this conceptual design. 
And the, the idea is, you know, you can put something inside your ear. It's invisible, can be hearing aid, you know, just like an earplug, or can be, you know, implant. You put inside, you don't see. It. Traditionally, you know, a ear bud will work like you get a sound in, you get a sound output, but you can put a lot of. I think that's a girl is uh, trying to do that. You know, you can turn that invisible ear plug or device into a bunch of sensing or sensors, which will not only record, in this case, motion, your heart rate, breathing rate, and EEG, EMG, you name it. And of course, you can put electrodes and stim as, 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 as a stimulator, not necessarily acoustic, but electrical, optical, or even tactile stimulation. And of course, you can integrate with the, the eye, so you can do auditory visual integration. Right. And if you have a sensing, you have stimulation capacities, you can do closed loop design. Right. It's pretty fun. If you put a wireless communication, right, you can talk to your cell phone, it's become an artificial intelligence as person assistant. And of course, the per your cell phone can talk to the cloud. Right? So you have access to the entire world. Right? And a system like that, you know, I think is a probably automated main machine uh, uh, interface. And I've been talking to the ENTs. I said, you know, your job in the next 20 years is not to put a cochlear implants in hearing impaired person. Just put a device like that in everybody including normals. I'll close my talk you know, by just take a home message following Dr. Tassali's uh, last slide. And I think in general, you know, from zero to one, it's very difficult, right? And so very few people can do that. Bill House was one of that pioneers, right? Remember all the oppositions he had to face and overcome, right, to develop this device. You know, the incremental stuff, many of us, including myself, probably can do. But now, from that one to end, if we want to design next generation technology, we call it, you have to go back to zero. That's very disruptive. And uh, we have to rely on the next generation scientists and engineers. And I'll close. finish my talk now and take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Questions, please, for Fan. Go ahead, Gert. Yeah. Thank you for a great talk. So um, your title is about Beyond um, Cochlear Implants. Yeah. Right? Um, and the workshop here is about uh, unobtrusive, non-invasive technologies, right? Um, could you comment what are some of the alternatives that are on the horizon for instance, regenerative medicine or other opportunities, right, for hearing impaired and, and other I guess, neurological Sorry. diseases that are related yeah. to the hearing system. Well, that's definitely disruptive technology. You know, instead of uh, electronics engineers, you know, hair cell regeneration, gene therapy, optogenetic approaches, right, to or stem cell approaches to solve, you know, hearing loss or other similar problems. Right. And you know, there's a lot of money being invested in that. Um, but I think uh, it's still, uh, I would say at least 25, if not 50 years away from the real application. And my regeneration friends have been telling me it's coming, it's coming. I've been waiting for 25 years. I think the next another 25 years. Uh, who knows? I hope it's that soon. <laughs> yeah. So even if you could regen, let's suppose we had a magic means by which to turn mm -hmm. support cells into hair cells. Suppose we could do that. And suppose those axons would grow back into the, to the brain stem. It's still an issue of getting the signal to the hair cell, right? Yeah. It's not so much, I think the hair cell technology, I'm actually not worried about that. I, that will happen. Yeah. All right. But it still has, that, it's the last centimeter, actually in this yeah. case, it's really the last millimeter. How do we how do we deal with that? We're not there. Right. How do we get there? Well, Professor Bruce uh, Wheeler <laughs> may, may answer that question better than I'm able to. Right? I mean, it's a, you're, gonna, a, you're absolutely right. We're giving him the chance yeah. right now. 
Wow. <laughs> uh, I, I look at the technologies, and we saw some yesterday where there are uh, people with, with thousands of electrodes, and they're very small, and that gets beyond your one millimeter for the mm -hmm. um, cochlear implant electrodes. Uh, I, there is a kind of an ultimate version, a, a limitation to this, which is almost all these electrodes get covered by scar tissue of some sort. Some, yeah. uh, and so the idea that you could actually address single neurons is probably impossible just because of the self-insulating um, properties of the brain. So there may be some limit. On the other hand, it's an awful lot better than the one millimeter to whatever your ratio was, 10,000 10, neurons. So we can do an awful lot better. But, but you're right about the connections. The connections are uh, an absolute uh, limitation. And, and doing the multiplexing helps a lot, but it doesn't get the right order of magnitude. Might for, the, for hearing, though. So. I totally agree. You know, I think to answer your question, you know, we need a, a combined technology where we have electronics on one side and we also have like a nerve growth factor on the other side. So we can create that micro environment similar to natural development. So we you know, have that right connection. I wonder if it would, I wonder if one could create an external cochlea. What I'm saying there is a neural implant mm. that's actually, in fact, makes biological connections with the hair cells, but with neurons that are located more on the surface, where you'd have much more access with high-density electrodes. In other words, creating another neuron in that circuit to transmit information peripherally to the hair cells. So no electrodes, axons in this case. Wow. That's okay. For, that's for regenerative medicine. <laughs> no, nothing's impossible, but and, uh, I will say, yeah, that's a great idea. Somebody uh, should work on that. Other questions, please. We've got a couple more minutes. Sure. <laughs> Very inspiring talk. I come from a device background. So yep. uh, you mentioned this size mismatch. So this is a follow-up question from Bruce Witter. Um, the size match of one to 1,000, uh, 1, something like that. Um, so the real question I think we should answer is, do we really need one electrode to one neuron cell, right? So in other words, how many neurons decode one word, one pitch, or you know, one tone? So that's the question we have to you know, answer yeah. first. Thank you. That, that, that's a great question, right? I mean, right now, there's a, there's a one to a thousand, perhaps more. And it would be hard to get a one to one. Hey, how about one to 10, one to 100? Well, that will be significant improvement. And I think uh, we'll see significant improvement in performance if we can do 1 to 110, 1 to 10, or 1 to 100. But you know, that's a, how do we do that? Right? So that's a, you're, you're a developer. Uh, talk to me. You know. uh -huh. I'm listening. It's the young folks with great ideas that we don't yeah, yeah. have. We're, we're, we yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just real quick. You mentioned the resistance from the deaf community. Is that mm -hmm. abating or is that staying as strong? Or as cochlear implants get more common, yeah. what's happening there? Yeah, another great question. It's the cultural side of things. Um, the deaf community, the, the, hard, the old hardcore, right? Um, they're still a little bit resistant, but some of them actually have turned quietly say, can I get a cochlear implant? Mm -hmm. But a little bit too little, too late for them because they didn't hear before, they used sign language, they got implanted, the performance not good. And the younger generation, I mean, it's a pretty much everybody got a cochlear implant these days. So I think that resistance uh, is fading. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation.